Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. The presidential primary season is fast approaching. Who the candidates pick as their policy advisors can tell us a lot about where they might try to take the country. To discuss the thinkers behind the candidates are Michael Barone, senior writer at U.S. News and World Report and author of Our Country, The Shaping of America from Roosevelt to Reagan. E.J. Dion, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of They Only Look Dead, Why Progressives Will Dominate the Next Political Era. Franklin Four, associate editor for U.S. News and World Report, and David Kuznet, a visiting fellow at the Economic Policy Institute and author of Speaking American, How the Democrats Can Win in the 90s. The topic before the House, the candidates think tanks. This week on Think Tank. Where might Al Gore or George W. Bush or Bill Bradley or John McCain try to lead the country if elected to the presidency? One way to find out is to look at the teams they assemble to advise them. Thank you very much. Governor George W. Bush is promoting what he calls compassionate conservatism. Not everyone knows what Governor Bush means by that. Former Secretary of Education William Bennett and former Indianapolis Mayor Stephen Goldsmith are two prominent advisors helping that philosophy take shape. And Al Gore pushes an agenda that he calls practical idealism. Well, who are the practical idealists advising him? One is Harvard University's Elaine Kmark, who has been a longtime Gore advisor, lending intellectual firepower to the vice president. So too is Bill Galston of the University of Maryland, a frequent guest on Think Tank. Should it be doing trifling things? What about Senator Bill Bradley? In an interesting twist, he recently received the backing of financial guru David Smick. Now, Smick was a one-time ally and advisor for former Republican vice presidential candidate Jack Kemp. Bradley has also long been in touch with Harvard University's Cornell West. Arizona Republican John McCain has kept the identity of his advisors close to the vest, although it is said that Henry Kissinger is among them. Sources close to McCain say he prefers to rely on his own instincts and his full-time senatorial staff. For an in-depth look at the minds behind Campaign 2000, we turn to our expert panel. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Let us proceed quickly with one question that has been uh, troubling me. It is being said that, well, these two parties are turning into mush at the 49-yard line, and they are really the same. What do you think? I think they're more at the 35-yard lines. They're, one is a center-right party, one is a center-left party. The Democrats aren't going to nationalize industry. The Republicans aren't going to rip up the whole social safety net. But there are big differences. If you put these advisors in a room, they'd have some big arguments with each other. David? I think sometimes issues come up that remind the leaders of the parties that, they're that they speak for very different constituencies. And you see them in the minimum wage debate, where there's near unanimity among the Democrats to raise the minimum wage. And the Republicans' first instinct is how to, since that's a popular issue, how to couple that with tax breaks for people at the top of the ladder. So there is a difference. There is a difference. My sense is that uh, compassionate conservatism has been slightly misunderstood. I don't think it's really a policy of triangulation, moving the Republicans to the right. I think it's abandoning some of the party's allergic reaction to government. I think that people like Giuliani and Bush believe that you, can, you need to have a strong executive power in government who can break up bureaucracies. And, um, but does that make them ever more like the Democrats? But, but the, the difference is, is that they want to use government towards very conservative ends. Well, I think there's a big premium this year for voters, uh, for uh, politicians to state their positions in consensus-minded form. People hate the sort of confrontation. They want an end to arguments and bitterness and so forth, as if everybody in politics should just agree. But when you look behind, 
the consensus mood in which they frame their issues. You do see serious differences of opinion on issues between the Republicans and the Democrats. The Republicans tend to think that uh, when you get more towards markets and competition, things will work better. Democrats are headed, and to a surprising extent on health care, toward government regulation, government diktat, uh, and the idea that more government spending will solve problems. Okay, so, uh, and I vote with you all. They're, they're contrary to some of the received wisdom that is preposterous that the two parties are really uh, uh, for the same thing. Now, now let me ask you just again, very briefly, how important are these campaign advisors? I think it depends on the candidate. I think if you look at Bush, he has built his own think tank. I think his whole structure with Goldsmith doing domestic policy, Larry Lindsay used to be on the Federal Reserve Board doing economic policy. Colleague of mine at American Enterprises. Right. right. Uh, Condoleezza Rice doing foreign policy. I mean, he's built a very elaborate structure and you can see a kind of range. Christopher DeMuth, who is the president of AI, is big in that operation. Right, and uh, uh, Josh Bolton kind of oversees it. You see a big structure which represents a kind of range on the center right to the right. And I think that those advisors shape his policy. Bradley uh, is... is uh, Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl also, right? Right, I mean, and, and on the forum, I think you're going to have some interesting internal arguments within the Bush camp because within conservatism there are some serious arguments. Whether you're talking about domestic policy on compassionate conservatism or foreign policy between um, different kinds of realists and hardliners. But, but in, in, in Bush's case, uh, the think tank is quite important. Oh, it's, I mean, he's got a structure for decision making in this thing that sounds a lot like the executive branch of the government, the, you know, with, you know, sort of OMB figures being called in and the department people and you get the kind of arguments that EJ is talking about. It's really uh, of, of the, these four candidates that we're discussing, it's the closest thing that would move right into being in the government. Well, Al Gore, on the other hand, is, is also brought in people with a, like Elaine K. Mark, we mentioned, with a lot of experience in government who knows that sort of inside stuff very well. Well, it's important, I think, to mention that Bush needs a think tank approach because he hasn't formulated his, his, his strategy for dealing with a lot of these big economic issues or foreign policy. Well, he, he's never been a federal level politician and the others all have. And Gore has been he, vice he, president right, and as right. such, and, and as a, under the vice presidency is reinvented by Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale, mm -hmm. maintained by presidents of both parties ever since. He's been an integral part of government over the last seven years and if he wants, he may want to forget, uh, people forget some parts of that. Like, but his, he's had genuine, uh, serious experience you know, it, with the it, operation of it, government. It, is it, I mean, if you take it from a voter's perspective, is, is one to feel better because, well, candidate Jones or George Bush has really assembled a top flight in-house think tank with some people I respect, or is it better to say, well, you know, John McCain has been in the Senate or Bill Bradley has been in the Senate for all these years. He damn well knows what he thinks. He's got, a, he's got a Senate staff, but uh, he's my man because he doesn't have to rely on, on a bunch of people. I think, I think you can sort of almost see what, what two, two polls of what an advisor can do is with, with, with George W. Bush, you almost have a sense that these advisors are being brought in as tutors to help, help him bone up for some kind of exam that he needs this to do a lot of work for. This was the case between 1998. He spent a lot of time on <laughs> exactly that. And with... with with Bob Reich, the former labor secretary and professor of, of, eco of economics, endorsing Bill Bradley, that was more of a sense that he was a validator. It wasn't that, that Bradley was lacking in expertise on these issues, but if Bob Reich comes forward and says he's working with him, that validates Bradley's concern for now, that. Now, Bi Bill Bradley has, as I recall, at least as senator, and even now, has been an ardent free trader. And Bob Reich, in his current incarnation at least, is not an ardent free trader. That's not true. That's not true. No, Reich, Reich was always, I, David, Reich has always been. I, well, I want to make a point here. David happens to also be my son-in-law, and he is directly contradicting me. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, unless, unless you define free trade as trade without rules, or trade only with rules that protect investors and, and intellectual property, and not with rules that protect anything else, Reich has always been something of a celebrator of the global economy. And but, but Ben, I think one of the things we're seeing is that uh, a, a Gore or a Bush uh, with their more elaborate campaign um, think tank structures and Gore's experience in the executive branch of government are probably more ready to kind of move in and superintend the presidency which consists of these huge staffs. 
the necessity for which I'm not sure, but we do have them and all those slots to fill. A Bradley or a McCain would have a lot more slots to fill with people that we don't know who they would be yet. Would it fair, would, fair, be fair to say that they're working out of a senatorial mode of management of, of a staff? Out of, out of a staff that's yeah. much more of the size of a Senate staff. When Bill Bradley was in the Senate on the tax reform back, for example, he did not have a large staff. He had one or two major staffers that he worked with, and he worked with other senators and with House members himself very effectively. Uh, but it was a small operation. Uh, Bush now has this big operation. Gore is used to the big operation of the White of the White House of the Clinton Gore White House. Um, and, and, and if he it, turned if he turned to athletes, some of us would hope it would be to Charles Barkley, not to Bill Walton. Is that right? Well, I, I would I would think so, Ben. But <laughs> right. the fact okay. is, right. yes, right. Uh, right. Right. as Woodrow Wilson once said, that uh, the presidency in the modern term may be limited to. Uh, uh, scholarly athletes, of which there was a, a limited supply. See, I, I feel like making a case for Bill Walton, but I won't. What I, I think the interesting, um, <laughs> the interesting thing God, about yeah. Bradley right. is that he has built more a network than a think tank, and I think that's the, that's part of the contrast between him and Bush. Bradley has always liked assembling groups of intellectuals around him to kick policy around. You know, when you talk to people around town, there are people who are not formal Bradley advisors. But with work he's done at places like the Aspen Institute, he's run into a lot of policy types. So he tends to bring them together, pick their brains on the issue at hand that he happens to be interested in, and then moves on to the next group. So there'd be a group of people he might draw from, but it's not structured as formally as the Bush structure. And I think those are two models we're seeing in this campaign. I think what you're describing is the, Clint is the Bill Clinton model that, uh, that in the 92 campaign, and certainly early in the administration, he was at the hub of it of an enormous network of experts on social and economic policy and even the cultural dimensions of, of, of public issues that he would call, that he would draw upon personally and that he had some, some relationship with. I'm not sure that any candidate now has anything approaching that kind of eclectic range of intellectual interests or, or acquaintances. Bradley I mean, might come close. Gore might come close. Oh, I think yeah. the Bush operation has. But that's a not. Of, I don't think you'd find. That's a pretty. I think with all due respect to the governor, I don't think you'd find. I mean, there were stories of, of, Clinton calling up, you know, anyone from. William Julius Wilson to Martin Marty, late at night, and 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 discussing the fine points of social policy or, or the or the role of of faith-based institutions in public life. I don't think anyone believes that. George W. Bush is personally calling up <laughs> a wide range of intellectuals oh, I think and he's, I, engaging them in, in, I would in, disagree with in, that in, somewhat, in the discussions David. as a peer. I think that he's... Is uh, Naomi he's Wolf not a sign of eclecticism? Yeah. 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 No, I, I think it's pretty clear that George W. Bush has spent serious time with and concerning uh, serious public uh, policy experts uh, from a fairly wide range of thought in the Republican Party. He hasn't had these serendipitous late night conversations, but I wonder if in retrospect those Clinton things really were very productive in terms of intelligent, sustained public policy. Uh, and I also think, uh, just I think Bill Bradley is pretty eclectic in the group that he draws from. You know, the, who was the person front and center at the debate? There was his wife, who is, is, is a professor, and Cornell West, who is a self-avowed <coughs> Well, it was at one point in his career self-avowed Marxist, but I think Bradley's been able to span the spectrum. You know, during the '86 tax reform, he uh, spent a lot of time talking to Jeffrey Bell, who is now Gary Bauer's top advisor, and, uh, and who was his opponent in the 1970 yeah, I mean, campaign, right. which is very interesting yeah. I mean, that they had become close. I mean, yeah. it's true you could form an organization called Marxist Investment Bankers and Supply Siders for Bradley. I mean, that is pretty. Well, that's yeah. what this uh, Smick thing is right. about. I mean, he would be a Kemp supply sider going yeah, over as, to Yeah, as somebody who was uh, advising. Bill Bradley in the 1978 campaign, he did take in, in, in an intellectually you, you, serious. You were, you, I working for Peter Hart, who was and, his pollster, oh, so I was okay. right. perhaps a step away. But I was involved in some meetings. Uh, Bill Bradley did take seriously the arguments of uh, Jeffrey Bell, his de his Republican opponent, who was an advocate of the supply side tax cut. At that time, most Democrats were just treating that as. Um, well, the term voodoo economics invented by George Bush is as crazy. You know, you had to have high taxes to have government operate. Uh, Bradley took a somewhat different view, and that led in time to the 86 Tax Reform Act, which lowered rates and eliminated preferences. What's interesting about Bradley is he then supported the 90 and 93 tax increases, which tended to raise rates and put in more preferences. 
Uh, and we'll have to see if he gets engaged with Al Gore, who is in favor of the Clinton policy of you know, targeted tax right. cuts, which is another way of saying tax preferences, uh, or if, if he follows through on his own initiative in 86, where he said, let's get rid of the preferences and have lower rates. Let me ask you a question. Is, is, with the intense media scrutiny going on of each of these candidates, and we could mention, by the way, Steve Forbes, who is a one-man think tank, and we could mention Pat Buchanan, who is another one-man think tank, but let's stick to the four. It, it, is, isn't there a premium and a bonus put on capturing a big name, in Bradley's case, uh, Robert Reich, so that you're sort of in a bidding contest not to get the person's advice, but to get the person to give a press conference and say, I'm for Bill Bradley and I'm a smart guy and some people agree with me, even if the candidate himself thinks, yeah, I don't believe what Wright says. I mean, has that gone on? Well, I think you gain credibility when you have somebody with you whom a lot of people respect. Steve Goldsmith, the mayor of Indianapolis, is a good example of that. My experience is that people all across the political spectrum, even liberals who disagree with Goldsmith, respect him as somebody who's innovative, who cares a lot about poor people, and has tried to do a lot of interesting things in Indianapolis. To have him with you helps Bush because people say, well, maybe he thinks like him. And I think you can reproduce that among some of the you other candidates. With, uh, George W. Bush on foreign policy is the only one of these four candidates who hasn't been a member of Congress, hasn't vo had a voting record on foreign policy, hasn't had a policy engagement. On it. And he's taken care to get some very top-level people. And you're talking about Paul Wolfowitz, uh, Richard Pearl, George Schultz, the former Secretary of State. Uh, and according to the account, Condoleezza Rice, the former Provost of Stanford, people who, by their own accounts, say that, that he has engaged them seriously and in discussions on foreign policy, that's an attempt to give assurance to voters that Mr. Bush, who has no record of foreign policy except some dealings with Mexico, is capacity as governor of Texas. Po politically, I think it helps him as well. He's got to reassure social conservatives that he understands where they're coming from. So having William Bennett or Marvin Olasky or Ralph Reed talking to you about policy and politics this is doesn't governor help. Bush. This is Governor Bush. The other thing is is that I think with um, I think it really helps I think I think Bush I, I'm sorry, I think Bradley and Gore are both guys who kind of figure themselves somewhat intellectual and I think that they like the idea of of having these intellectuals kind of clustered around them, even if they're not actually giving them any sort of really serious substantive advice a lot of the time. What about the McCain idea, uh, apparently they are backgrounding from his shop that they really don't want to, normally these bucket shops are, are out there saying, oh, so-and-so advises, so-and-so advises. He, he's taken the position apparently that, uh, well, he has his own staff, uh, there's a Senate staff, he knows what he thinks. Is, is, that a good, uh, is that a good strategy? I'm not sure. I think there's a, I mean, this year, and Michael said there's a premium on consensus, there's also a premium on authenticity. People want a candidate like Bradley or McCain, who does not seem to be a creature of political handlers. I think the, there also may be an increasing uneasiness with a candidate who needs advisors to, to teach him the basics of, of foreign or domestic policy. I don't think people want a candidate who is not involved in an intellectual exchange with people of like-minded goals and specific knowledge. I think that, I think that may be carrying the notion of the of the of, of authenticity too far. Right. There's a sense. Hold, of hold, 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 hold on one second. We, we are going to run out of time shortly. Um, let me present a few hypotheticals of, of what the next president might have to face with uh, have to face, and considering their advisors and who they would be listening to, let's see uh, where they come out. And these are going to have to be. Uh, uh, short, short answer so we can go around the room. Um, Alan Greenspan is reappointed by Bill Clinton and one year later he retires. Who does the next president pick? To well, be the a Democrat might well pick Bob Rubin. On the Republican side, I'm not sure who, whom he would pick. And Bob Rubin would, would not be far from where Alan Greenspan stands on most of those issues. No, ever so slightly different, but not very different. Who, who would... Uh, what well, well, EJ meant, I, th I think you'd find a very similar View, range of views with Al Gore and Bill Bradley. I think where the example EJ gave shows how the inside baseball of political uh, of policy advisors might play out because it was the famous battle of the Bobs in the Clinton administration between yeah. Bob Rubin 
representing a fiscal conservative viewpoint than Bob Reich representing more of an economic populist viewpoint. And, Bob and if Bradley goes in deeply indebted as well as advised by Bob Reich, it would be interesting how, 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 that, how that might play out in his relationship yeah, with Bob Reich. Bob Reich, with all due respect, would not be confirmed. No, as, I'm not saying uh, that Reich right, would be the, right. no, no, the, no, would be the next Greenspan. He, he doesn't have an economics PhD, for goodness sake. <laughs> he does not. He's a lawyer. No, he's a lawyer. Right. Right. Uh, remember, Bradley didn't vote to uh, for, to approve Greenspan in the first place, That's and right. he's yes. made noises that, well, I'm not sure who I'm going to appoint. Uh, the second in in command of the Fed right now is an African American guy named Ferguson, who Roger I think Ferguson. would Roger Ferguson would be a likely candidate. Uh, Bush, I don't know, Lindsay might be a likely. Who had been on the Fed? Yeah, yeah. Might be Larry, Larry Lindsay, Lindsay had, had, had been on the Fed. Who on the Fed? Yeah, I think a Republican president would probably pick somebody who they thought would go along with, with uh, similar policies to Alan Greenspan. I don't think a Democrat would get too far off that. It's a little harder to say, though, when you're talking about the more lightly staffed candidates, <coughs> Bill Bradley and John McCain, than it is okay. to say about the heavily staffed candidates. Next, uh, next hypothetical, let's go the other way. Uh, <clears throat> a year from now, uh, two, a year and a half from now, a Supreme Court vacancy comes up. Who would these guys go to? Well, Al Gore, um, who always says he doesn't like litmus tests for Supreme Court, in fact, has a litmus test for Supreme Court, which he won't call as such, but it is. The Democrats have to go with somebody who is uh, uh, with a proposition that Roe v. Wade is good constitutional law. The fact that most constitutional scholars, including most of them who vote Democratic, think that it's crackpot con law, not good law. Uh, they're going to have to squirm a little to find people like that, but they, they will do so. And the Republicans similarly will appoint somebody who takes the view that most legal scholars do, which is that Roe v. Wade is crazy as a constitutional law decision, and uh, hope that the court will uh, reverse itself. Frank? One interesting thing. We, you we buy that? I, I actually do buy that. And uh, are you surprised, Michael? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, and one, one thing that uh, might be interesting is that Bush's father ran into a lot of problems with his uh, judicial appointees. There were some question whether they were really heavyweight enough. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him nominating somebody like a Richard Posner to the bench or an Epstein or some real solid, very esteemed conservative legal scholar. David, who's who's going to who, who would pick who for that? I imagine the the Gore and Bradley nominations would be similar. What with the issue that Michael raises, what would be interesting? What might May, there might be a difference between the George W. Bush corporate style and the John McCain lone wolf style would be the degree to which the, 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 either one's nominations would be more acceptable to the organized religious right. It would seem that as someone who's involved more in Republican constituency politics, are, are you give us George a name? W. Bush, I think, is, it, it's more likely to have made commitments to the organized religious right than John McCain. Gee, give me, a, for example, a pointy. Well, I, th I imagine the name... The name, the, the name that sort of, I imagine for the organized religious right, the name that is what they don't want is another David Souter. That that's the face oh, yeah. of the elder sure. George Bush that they don't like. They want, um, yeah, they want somebody probably with a settled judicial record in their direction, and there are some activist conservative judges on the U.S. Courts of Appeals right. now that yeah. would yeah. fill that bill. Yeah. Like uh, Larry Silberman or some of them. Yeah, like the right. Fourth Circuit has Frank several. Frank Easterbrook. Yeah. On the, yeah. Yeah, right. in, I mean, the Egypt Virginia, Jones. the circuit that sits in Virginia is, is full of the uh, well, George Bush might okay. uh, appoint. You know, I suspect that Bradley or Gore will look for moderate liberals much like Clinton did who, don't, who could be confirmed by a Senate likely to be Republican. I mean, he's my friend, so I'll throw him out as an example. Merrick Garland, who's a judge in the Court of Appeals here. Um, I, Cass Sunstein is a very interesting yeah. professor of law at Chicago. Um, Cass may have written too many interesting books to be confirmed. We know that that makes it hard. But I think that, that Gordon Bradley would look for people who could, uh, who could, who would be more moderately liberal but could get confirmed. I, I mean, this is on the assumption that the Republicans keep control of the Senate, which right. is likely which is but not, likely, not, 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 it's not certain. certain, but not right. yeah. Thank you, Michael Barone, E.J. Dion, Frank Four, and David Kuznet, and thank you. We at Think Tank encourage feedback from our viewers, particularly via email. It is very important to us. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to 
New River Media, 11507th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.